Haggai 2, 10 through 19. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now then. Consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there was but ten. When one came to the wine vat and drew fifty measures, there was but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Well, I need to take you back a little bit this morning. I need to take you back to the year 538 B.C. We're going to look in the book of Ezra, so you might want to start finding it. I need to take you back there. This is when Zerubbabel the governor and Joshua the high priest in the first wave of these post-Azilic Jews who have been in captivity in Babylon, they are now going to return to their land in Judah. Turn to the book of Ezra, Ezra 3, 1 through 6. Ezra 3, 1 through 6. The reason I need to go back is so that we get a better understanding of what's been taking place ever since these Jews and their leaders have returned. What has been happening? For 18 years they have been back in the land. At the decree of a Gentile king, a Persian king named Cyrus, they have come back into the land. They have returned to rebuild their towns, their lives. And most importantly, they have returned to worship at the temple of God to go back to their national identity, which is the temple in Jerusalem. Last week... We saw how God had given them the treasures of the nations. And these were given to rebuild the temple. At the decree of Cyrus, Haggai preached, This silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. I will shake all nations and all the treasures of the nations shall come in and I will fill this house with my glory, declares the Lord. And so by the decree of a Gentile king, God shakes those Gentile nations and He gives all the Jews everything they need. All the materials that they will need, no expense spared, all paid for, because He is shaking the nations. Hopefully you found Ezra 3, verses 1-6. through Let's look at that. Let me read that for us. When the seven month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance 
to with what was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. Then, in accordance to what was written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. Through the foundation of the though, excuse me, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. In verses 10 and 11. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by King David of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Well, what's going on? They're back in their land as we see. But the first thing that Zerubbabel, the governor, the leader of these people, this, this would-be king, the first thing that he does as he commands the altar of the Lord to be built. And then Joshua, the high priest, he commands the priests to begin their regular priestly duties according to the law of Moses. And then all the people worship God in their gratitude, as I just read. Now try to imagine this. Try to imagine what this altar looked like, what this scene is like. They have returned to a decimated city that has been destroyed and has sat for almost 70 years with nothing. And here, this altar is being built. It, it is nothing more than a rough stone base. Stones that are non-hewn. They're, they're rocks that are stacked. And they're stacked approximately five feet tall and in an eight-foot tall square diameter. This altar, this roughly stacked altar, is used daily to offer God sacrifices of animals and to burn fragrant, fragrant incense to Him. This altar, it's not spectacular, it's not beautiful, but it's being used seven days a week, morning and evening, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, the smoke of the sacrifices are rising into the air and they are rising as a pleasing aroma into the nostrils of God. And then they rebuilt the temple's foundation. They unearthed all this stone. They removed debris and burnt timber, and they moved dirt and all the overgrowth. They restacked enormous boulders in a rectangular layout with the altar of burnt offerings right there in the middle of it. Try to imagine this site on the side of the hill with nothing but this rock foundation and this rock altar that is in the middle. And their sacrifices of gratitude are being offered daily to the Lord. But do you know what? They were offering acceptable worship. It was pleasing worship. It was undefiled, unstained worship. It, it is worship that is prescribed in the law of Moses, yes, 
but it is worship that came from their hearts. As I read from Ezra, with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people, with a great shout of praise, go to the Lord. Here's my point. Here they are in this destroyed, unsecure city with a temple that is in shambles, with nothing more than a rock foundation and a rock altar. They are living in the land amongst the Gentiles and the Samaritans. They have no livelihood established yet, yet here they are praising God. They were singing genuine praise. They were offering heartfelt worship. Everything that they were doing in that time was clean, acceptable, holy, undefiled worship. This heart worship that's being expressed here, this is what the writer of Hebrews is communicating when he said, let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. So for two years, they worshiped the Lord. This is the sight. This is ground zero for two years as they are living back in the land. They worship the Lord in undefiled heart worship. But we need to fast forward now to the time of Haggai. Let's go up 18 years. Now we're in the year 520 B.C. And Haggai the prophet is sent and you know what you find the people doing? Still offering worship. Still offering sacrifices. Still burning at that altar day and night. The altar, it burns daily. 24 hours a day. 7 days a week. 365 days per year. Animals are still being offered. Incense is still being burned. The altar smolders continually. The priests, they haven't left their posts. The people haven't stopped bringing their sacrifices. They haven't stopped offering worship to God. But we know from this book that their worship was displeasing to the Lord. What they have been doing for the last 16 years in their offering has been displeasing to Him. It's no longer a pleasing aroma in His nostrils. It is no longer from the heart. It is mechanical. Oh, they're, they're holding to the law of Moses. They're doing what is prescribed in the law of Moses, yes. But they're just going through the motions and their worship is unacceptable. Why? Why is this unacceptable worship to God? They are doing what the law of Moses prescribes, yet it is unacceptable. Why? Because of their hearts. This is what the Bible describes as the inner man. It is the mind. It is the will. It is the emotion. It is understanding. It is our conscience. This is what it means to be the heart of a man. Their hearts had become unfeeling unmoved their hearts were distracted and dirty the unfinished temple is a symptom of that the symptom of what's going on inside is being seen or revealed on the outside this morning i want us to see this from this passage uncleanness is contagious but cleanness is not set your heart upon this. Uncleanness is contagious, but cleanness is not set your heart upon this. Look at verse 10 again. 
Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. There we read on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. The date is December 18th, 520 B.C. It's been two months since the last time that Haggai is stirred up to speak to these people. It has been two months since the last time that God has commissioned him and charged him to speak to these people to stir their hearts. They're closing in on almost four months that the prophet has been with this people, preaching and prophesying to Judah. Last time, we saw that he was sent to encourage them Be bold, be strong, fear not, for I am with you, the Lord says. I I am doing something in the nations. I am bringing forth my unshakable kingdom. Build, build the temple and worship me. But now, as God does with us, but now Haggai is sent to expose another sin. He will pose two questions to the priest of Judah to do this. First, in verses 11 and 12, the first question. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest about the law, the law of Moses. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food... Does it become unholy? And the priest answered and said, no. In other words, if I have sanctified food, consecrated food, holy food, and that food is considered clean before God, and I use it to touch other food items, those food items, will they not become ceremonially clean? Because my food is clean? Answer is no. Because I have clean food and I touch something else does not make it clean. The second question asked in verse 13. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, any of these food items, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does does become unclean. That is, if I am already unclean because I have touched something that the law of God says is unclean, like a dead body, if I then touch clean food items, will they now become unclean because I am unclean? And the answer is yes. This is the basic principle found in God's Word. Numbers 19.22 says, Whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean, and anyone who touches it shall be unclean. Think about that for a second. A sick person cannot catch health by touching a non-sick person. But a healthy person can become sick from contact with a sick person. That is how the principle of transmission normally works. That's how uncleanness works. It defiles what is clean. And it's not the other way around. So where is Haggai going with all of this? The answer is in verse 14. Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. The Lord is declaring this people and this nation unclean in their worship. We've heard this language before, this people. Do you know what your son did? Do you know what your daughter did? This people. God is displeased. They have been offering worship, yes, daily, all day long, 
all year long. They have been offering worship, but it is unholy and it is defiled worship. Everything once considered a holy offering has been made filthy by their hands. The people are all contagious. And their uncleanness has gone from person to person to person, and it's infecting them all. One commentator remarks, their worship was likened to a dead body decaying in Jerusalem and making everything contaminated. This is how God sees their worship. And at the end of verse 14, God says, what they offer there is unclean. What their hands offer where is unclean is my question. What their hands offer there on the altar is unclean. What the priest offered to me daily is unclean. What the people bring as their sacrifice is unclean. Sure, they were holding to this external display of worship. They were doing what they were supposed to do. They looked like they were worshiping. But they were not worshiping God in spirit and truth. They did not come to God and to His altar with pure hearts. For 16 years, Judah has become infected with sin, and they didn't even know it. They thought it was really just a matter of not building the temple, and once we start on that, we're good again. But their worship for these last 16 years has been unacceptable, defiled, and dirty to God. They wrongly believed by simply doing the religious act of praise, the heart would then follow in praise. Doing the act of worship, well, that will make my heart follow in worship, is what they thought. This is the same offense that Jesus constantly excoriates the Pharisees and the scribes for. Keepers of the law, fastidious in keeping the law, but they did not worship in spirit, in heart, in truth. The Christian church is no different. We are no different. We think by doing the external things of worship is an act of worship. We think by doing these externals that the heart will in turn worship. It it must in turn worship because we're doing these things. Case in point, music. Most often, Music is referred to in a church as worship. Sing songs, do music, you worship. Churches seem to think that if we sing songs that hype us up, songs that are lively and loud, emotional, and certainly repetitive, then the song will prepare our hearts to listen to God's Word. How many times have we heard this? We, we have to whip the crowd up. We need to get everyone emotional so they can be prepared to hear the Word of God. It's no mystery why we call them worship teams or praise teams. Think about this. This is what worship teams think their role is. They use the external acts of songs. You know, the mechanical act of singing. The mechanical act of singing to stir us up and to create in our hearts a response to lead us into worship. 
you know, that's nothing more than proverbial cart before the horse. Let me give you a good show. Let me give you all the elements of worship, and then I'm sure that you'll, then you'll worship. I'm convinced of that much of what we see being called worship in churches is nothing of the sort. Rather, what we see in churches is unclean. It's heartless. It's unholy. And it's disgusting to God. This is not a new topic for God. Listen to what God says to the prophet Isaiah regarding Judah's worship offerings to him. Isaiah 1. God speaking, speaking to the people says, What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. I thought this is what they're supposed to do. This is what they're doing in Haggai's day. Twice a day, every day, all year long. The prophet goes on to say, When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, oh God, I will hide my eyes from you even though you make many prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. That's how God feels about this kind of worship. The type of worship that is heartless. The type of worship that is mechanical. Prescribed, yes. Spirit and truth, no. Let me ask you about your hearts. Why are you here today? Why are you here this morning? Are you here because you seek worship with God in spirit and truth? Or are you here because it's Sunday and that's what you do? Are you here to offer God clean, holy praise? Or are you here to be seen by others? Are you here to bring a sacrifice of praise? Or are you here because you're scheduled to serve this morning? Are you here for anything, for any reason, other than pure and undefiled worship? Think about that question. Are you here for anything else than worshiping God? Because if you're not here for that reason and that reason alone, then then I use Isaiah's words and I say, cease from doing evil. Cease from doing evil. You know, we can go through all of our points of liturgy And we do every Sunday. We can go through all these points of liturgy that are in your bulletin. But if it's just that, it's doing the liturgy and not worshiping from the heart, then God says, this people worships me in an unclean way. This people is coming to me to worship me in an unholy, unclean, ungodly way. And my soul hates it. God's immutable. He hasn't changed his opinion on this. Let me confess something to you. Fifteen years ago, I experienced worship. I've been a believer for over 25 years. Fifteen years ago, 
I experienced worship, I think, for the first time. I had been saved in the Southern Baptist Church. I had attended the church. I became a member of that church. I served in that church. But I thought worship was all about the externals. I thought it was about the liturgy. I thought about, it was about the stained glass windows. I thought it was about the building. I thought it was about the people. I thought it was about all those things that religious people do on any given Sunday. I'm ashamed to admit, I'm ashamed to admit that. This is what was taught to me. This is what I understood worship to be. It's, it's the music whipping you up into a frenzy. It's the lights. It's the lack of lighting. It's everything that we are doing nowadays to give you a worship experience that you'll hear. I didn't realize that I had offered undefiled worship to God, and I've been doing that week after week. But 15 years ago, I was with a group of people I didn't know in a church building I had never been to, and I was singing songs I had never heard before. And I heard the Word of God preached. I, I mean preached. Light and heat spirit and truth I sang loudly I prayed earnestly and for the first time I worshiped God I can remember it as vivid as today I worshiped God for the first time I offered God heart praise I was overcome with the greatness of God I remember I gave from my heart what the Apostle Paul calls a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Yes, Paul speaking to Christians. This must assume that there is a smelly offering. This must assume that there is a sacrifice that is unacceptable. This must assume that there is unpleasing worship to give to God. I'll never forget that day. Why did I worship that day? What was different? Verse 15 gives us the answer. Now then, consider from this day onward. We saw this phrase, consider. Consider your ways. We saw this two times back in chapter 1 when Haggai admonished the people to consider what they were doing. This phrase, consider. Now then, consider. Consider. It literally means, set your heart upon. Set your heart upon. You know, a child will set his heart upon Christmas. He will make it his singular focus. He will long for it. He will crave for it. That is all he desires. That is all he speaks of. Fifteen years ago, I worshipped that day because I set my heart upon the Lord. I considered and I set my heart upon Him. I set my heart upon God's majesty, upon His holiness, upon His mercy, upon His grace. I contemplated, Jesus Christ has saved me from sin's penalty. He has saved me from the wrath of God. And he has saved me from divine, perfect judgment of God. The very thing that I have told you before, the very thing that God revealed to me when I was born again, that God is holy and God will send sinners to hell and I am accountable to hell, the very thing that I will use as a testimony was the thing that I had forgotten. That day I thought about I don't deserve this. I don't deserve salvation. Why would you save a wretch like me, Lord? Why, as the song said, why would you waste love on me? Ask the advocate above why he would. Lord, 
why would you spare me what I deserve in eternal hell? And though I can't answer those questions, it's in the preordained purpose of God according to the good counsel of Himself. I know this. Deuteronomy 10.15 tells me that God has set His heart on His people. The same thing that Haggai is saying. Set your heart upon the Lord. The same thing that He is telling those people you must do to worship Him right, to be clean, is the very thing that Moses tells me in Deuteronomy, that God has set His heart on me. God has set His heart and His singular focus on me and you. God longs for you. God desires you. God is focused on you, His child. So then in verse 15, God is saying, as I have set My heart upon you, Judah, now then, Set your heart upon me from this day forward. Be singular focus, singular minded focus. Focus on me with great longing. Don't dwell on all the destruction. Don't dwell on the fears that you have from people. Don't dwell on anything that disappoints because those things are all idols. Only dwell on the Lord from now on and again become a pleasing aroma in his nostrils. Otherwise, my discipline will remain in play. Look again, starting in verse 15. Haggai says, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? How did you do? How did you fare all those years of offering defiled worship? How did you fare when you were in Babylon? How did you fare under my displeasures? Oh, let me remind you. He goes on to say, when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20 I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Do you know why Jerusalem was sacked in the first place? Do you know why they were taken into captivity? Unclean worship, idol worship. They were always joining themselves to the idols, the false gods of the people, to the demons of the world. They had, in fact, set their hearts upon idols and no longer on the Lord God. And the Lord disciplined them for it. He sent prophet after prophet to warn them. And they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't turn. And so God disciplined them to get their attention to stop worshiping these false gods. They played the harlot. And God says, I disciplined you for your sin before there was one stone stacked on another stone. Before you came back to the land, you were being disciplined for your sin. Your crops, they produced half of what they should, and I struck you with every disease to get your attention, but you didn't listen to me. But today, now, set your hearts upon me. Consider And God graciously brings them home to start again. He brings them out of captivity. And He brings them home and He says, Go, start again. Rebuild the temple. Worship Me with a clean heart. And again, Haggai stresses the heart. Verse 18. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, set your heart upon Me this day. 
since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple is laid. You know, 18 years ago when you relayed that, and for the last 16 years you've been languishing, you've been weak, remember that. Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. You still struggle because you're still under the discipline of me. Oh, you're rebuilding. It took you 16 years to arouse you, but you're building, but you still will not worship me in a clean way. Chapter 1 makes this point clear, right? Judah's back in the land. And after two years of clean worship, they start worshiping in an unclean way. God said, because you have set your hearts on what is unclean, I am disciplining you. Therefore, in chapter 1, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and all their labors. What verses 18 and 19 tell us is that God's rod of discipline is still upon them. Even though they have rebuilt, they are still not stirred to the point of offering clean worship. They still have the sin of a divided heart. Their hearts are divided. It's not singular focused. It's not set on the Lord alone. This, what I'm describing here, this is an overlooked area of sin on why God disciplines us. We don't talk about this. We're in Christ and we're covered by the blood of Jesus and and God is satisfied in us. Yeah, because of Jesus, but He still has displeasure in what we offer Him. We don't talk about this. We don't talk about our divided heart. We don't talk about how we set our hearts upon filthy idols and then we join them to God. We offer mixed worship, unclean worship to Him all the time. Some of us are under the Lord's discipline right now. This is not an Old Testament thing. This is a God thing. This is how God deals with His people. He disciplines us. Many reasons why He does it, but this particular reason in Haggai is because of the sin of false, filthy worship. As I said, some of us are sitting right now under the Lord's discipline. He's doing it to get our attention. He is saying, consider Consider, consider your ways. Set your heart upon me and upon my glory, the glory I deserve. God is reminding us that I have spared you from death. I sent my son Jesus to take your sins. He triumphed where you failed. He is my well-pleasing sacrifice because He set His heart upon me. Jesus is the sweet-smelling aroma in my nostrils of pure and undefiled worship. He gave Himself as an acceptable worship offering to bring many sons and daughters to glory. And for this, Paul says, For we, Christians, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Let me remind you that the Lord chastens whom He loves. If He didn't, He doesn't love you. He chastens whom He loves. Remember the words of David when God chastened him for his wrong heart. King David. 
David says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. He physically feels the hand of discipline on him. Remember those Corinthian Christians who would not worship God in a pure manner. And Paul says, because you worship Him in an unclean way, there are many of you who are weak and ill, and some of you have died. That's the church. Remember, God's immutable. He doesn't change. He doesn't change His opinion on this. New covenant, old covenant. Do you come here week after week and your hearts are divided? They're captivated by idols. Do you come here and you go through the motions of worship? Idols are all those things that distract us from pure worship. Many, many, many things. It's often stuff that we think is harmless. Our idols are the things that we good Christians think they're harmless. Doesn't master me. Hasn't captivated me. I'm in control of them, not the other way around. No. You know, the harmless stuff that we get all caught up in. Presidential elections. Government. Inflation, spending, woke theology, leisure time, recognition. We get hung up in work and bills and physical pain and children in our health. We get hung up about we need to know the truth. These are all good things they sound like. These, these are all things that we shouldn't be concerned about, right? But have you set your heart upon them? You can say that you're just doing this because you're conscientious or you're being mindful or you want to be a good steward. We have all sorts of excuses for the idols that we harbor. But do you set your heart upon them? Because if you have, and we do, we come here to worship in a divided heart and God says, I am not pleased in that. We have to consider that, Christian, maybe the reason we have poor health, maybe the reason we have less money, uh, maybe the reason that we have chronic depression, maybe the reason we have more stress, is because the Lord's hand of discipline is being applied to us. We've got to stop saying, oh, I'm suffering for the Lord, when really, you could be suffering for evil. Peter's point in his letter don't use your freedom as a cloak to say, oh, I'm suffering from Christ when really you're committing evil. No, you're suffering because the Lord loves His children and He's always disciplining us for something. This case, it's sin. The Lord asks us, consider how you're faring. How'd you fare? How you doing? He says, repent and return and serve me. Set your hearts upon me. Cast off your filthy idols. Because with God, there's forgiveness. With God, there's favor. And this is what we see at the end of verse 19. Here we have a great word of favor towards his children. This is a promise to his children only. Consider from this day on, I will bless you. Oh, let me tear down prosperity gospel teaching right now. You know, when we see these terms, I will bless you, we immediately think of tangible physical things. Oh, he's going to take care of my bills. He's going to give me a really good car. He's going to give me wealth. He's going to give me luxury. He's going to give me vacation. I'm going to live until I'm 120. We, we think automatically tangible things because the church is infected by prosperity gospel. 
False worship. We need to stop equating blessing with stuff. This is not about stuff. Oh, sure, God, He might restore their crops, but He's not guaranteeing that. He's talking about a covenant favor that He has with His people. Covenant favor, you know, an unbreakable covenant love that He has for His people. One writer says, Divine blessing is not to be defined in terms of tangible things, but rather with the assurance of the Lord's favor. We, we just need to take a little quick trip through our Bible. Let me talk to you about blessing. What does it mean to be blessed by the Lord? Recall the words of God to His people. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. Refuge means, oh, somebody's chasing me. Danger. Blessed are those who seek after God with a whole heart. That will mean hardship. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, Lord. I'm sorry, did I hear that right? I'm blessed because I'm being disciplined? Recall the words of God and Jesus Christ to His people. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are you when you're hungry. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and say all sorts of slanderous things against you for my name's sake. That's blessing. We would say Jesus was blessed by God, right? We would say that. Do you agree that Jesus was the most blessed man that God has ever blessed? Would you agree to that statement without me going through the exercise of proving it? Would you agree? I thought you would. Let's, let's talk about this most blessed man. Our blessed Lord Jesus. Let's kill this idea of tangible stuff. Yet the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. He was blessed, the most blessed man ever, and he had no home. He made a meager living as a carpenter. He worked with his hands. Nobody makes money doing that stuff. He ate hand to mouth. He was dependent on his father day in and day out just to eat. He was persecuted. He was scorned. He was lied about. He suffered greatly for his singular-minded, heart-focused mission of saving sinners. His entire life was not characterized by tangible things, but by favor from his Father. Do a life study of Jesus. For some reason, he's not the one we want to emulate in the prosperity gospel because he had nothing. Nothing. From this day on, I will bless you. Judah, from this day on, I will bless you. Church, from this day on, I will bless you. We will still struggle with pain. We will still have disease, and we still won't make it to 120. We will still have financial ruin. We will still have persecution. We will have all of those bad things. But the heart that is set upon God is the one that has the favor of God. Charles Spurgeon adds a final note to discipline in the Lord's favor. He writes this note based on Psalm 38. If you read that, it's all about the discipline of the Lord on David. He sums up David's words by writing, Rebuked I must be, for I am an erring child, and thou a careful father. Oh, let me not be treated as an enemy or dealt with as a rebel, 
bring to remembrance thy covenant, thy fatherhood, and my feebleness, and spare thy servant. When you're being disciplined, that's where you want to be. Set your heart on the Lord and say, oh, I'm being disciplined for my rebellion, but don't remember me in your anger, in your fierce, white-hot anger, but have compassion on me as you do. Remember your covenant. Remember that I am a man and I am dust. Remember your servant and spare me. God does just this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he remembers your feebleness, he remembers his covenant, a covenant that is made in the blood of Jesus that has been put to your account. His blood has been put to your account and you are reckoned as righteous. You are justified in the sight of God. When we have divided hearts and we stray, listen, when we have divided hearts, and we stray when we are just like the hymn that we sang earlier, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. What's the remedy? Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart. Let me set my heart upon you. Take and seal it in thy courts above. Christian, fear not. Fear not. This is, the, this is what Haggai's been telling people. Fear not. Even after chasing idols, even after he chastens your soul, God has promised you favor, a blessing. Let's hear God's assurance of his pardon on us. Let's, let's hear God's favor on us. It comes from 1 Corinthians 6. Verses 9 through 11. There Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some as you. Such were you. But you were washed. Past tense. You were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Pray with me.